excited for you. And it's actually 1031 right now, and we've been praying all week. So let's start our time together with a word of prayer. God, we're so grateful for this moment that you called us to. I pray that uh, you would help us here at the Highlands, this church you've raised up, that we would declare our future in you, that there are people who are even right now desperately in need of you that don't know you. I pray that the faith of those in this room would pave the way for people to meet you ultimately, Lord. We pray for future marriages that will be saved, for prodigals that will be returned, for addictions and chains to be broken, Lord. We're praying for those broken single parents just like me who came and was restored. We're praying, Lord, for people who aren't even yet born, that they would know the goodness of God because of the faith of your people here. And we're praying you do a mighty work. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to the Highlands. We're so glad that you're here. And we are in the final week of a series we've called Declare Our Future. It's this new chapter of the Highlands that uh, God's writing for our story. But before I jump into the final part, I wanted to share with you a quick roadmap of where we're going for the next several weeks. I don't know if you like to know where you're going, but I do. And so we have something special planned every Sunday in May. Next week is Sunday of Sacrifice. I'll talk about more of that later. And then we got Mother's Day. We're going to honor all the moms of the Highlands. It's going to be a special day. And then we have our celebration Sunday on the third Sunday of May. That's where we're going to talk about the spiritual journey, what God did in this moment for us, followed by Memorial Day weekend. We have a special speaker to honor the fallen. And then in June, we're going back to the book of Acts, and we're going to be in Acts from June to December. It's going to be amazing. I can't wait to jump back. It's been an incredible season and story of the early church in the book of Acts. But we have a lot to get to. So instead of all the fluff and an opening story, we're just going to get right back into Scripture. And so take your Bible, turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 24, and I want to read a few verses to you. If you don't have your Bible, no worries. The verses will be on the screen. Also, our church app as well. I want to read to you a brief story about King David in the book of 2 Samuel 24. It's the last chapter of the book, and we read this amazing story of what King David did for the Lord his God. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 18, it says this, Gad came to David that day and said to him, Go up and set up an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arana the Jebusite. So David went up in obedience to Gad's command, just as the Lord had commanded. Arana looked down and saw the king and his servants coming toward him. So he went out and paid homage to the king with his face to the ground. Verse 21 says, Arana said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? David replied, To buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord so the plague on the people may be halted. Look at verse number 22. Arana says to David, My lord the king, you may take whatever he wants and offer it. Here are the oxen for a burnt offering and the threshing sledges and the ox yokes for the wood. Your majesty, Arana gives everything here to the king. Then he said to the king, may the Lord your God accept you. But look at David's response in verse number 24. So the king, David, he answered Arana and said, no, I insist on buying it from you for a price for I will not offer to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 20 ounces of silver. And look at verse 25. He built an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then the Lord was receptive to prayer for the land and the plague on Israel ended. I love this idea because we're going to talk about a word that's going to make you very uncomfortable today. And by the way, it, we talked a couple weeks about obedience. If that didn't make you uncomfortable, then the next week, last week, Pastor Amy's message on generosity made you uncomfortable. If that didn't make you uncomfortable, well, today we're talking about sacrifice. Sacrifice. I believe that sacrifice is such an important part of the Christian life that we don't often think about. And so today, for the next few moments, I want to talk through this idea of what does it mean for Christians to sacrifice. I believe there's a path of sacrifice in our life that, that, that we see sacrifice following if we'll be attentive to it. And so here's the first thought. We're going to jump right in. I'm going to share with you three simple thoughts today about what sacrifice means to a believer's heart. You see, the first item that we see, the first stop on the sacrifice's path is this. Number one, sacrifice attacks convenience. Convenience. 
Now, we love convenience. We love our Wi-Fi and our microwaves and our drive throughs We love convenience. But conversely, we hate inconvenience. Just a, a couple of weeks ago, I was at a red light ready to turn right, and the car behind me was honking for me to turn. Now, listen, I've been vulnerable in sharing you that I break my fair share of speeding laws, and so I, you know, I'm not that kind of driver, but I'm like, it's a red light, there's some lines I can't cross, and there's a car making a left-hand turn where I couldn't go, and the, the person behind me is like honking, upset that they're being inconvenienced by me obeying the law. What in the world? What's fascinating is later this driver actually ran over a squirrel on the road. True story, but that's another matter. And we do not like to be inconvenienced. Red lights are nothing but just an inconvenience. And all of a sudden now we live our life to be the most convenient way for us. So let's talk about this 21-day spiritual journey that we've been on. It's been very inconvenient at times to set a timer to pray every day. It's been very inconvenient to come to the church and maybe even some windy weather we've had this week and walk around on our walk of faith. Amy and I are on day 15 of a liquid fast, and I don't know if I would recommend you doing this, but we were praying, and my wife, by the way, is far more spiritual than I am because I had never done a liquid fast, and she has, of course, done that before. We're unequally yoked. Like, she's much more spiritual than I am. And in fact, she's like, no sugar, no pro, like she's, it's amazing, like what she's been doing. And I'm telling you, going on a liquid fast has been inconvenient. Maybe you're fasting sugar and you've been fasting something else. And what the idea of fasting is, is it makes life inconvenient for us. But I'm here to tell you, following Jesus is supposed to be inconvenient. These two words on our wall right here, and if you're watching online on our worship center, we have these huge words, following Jesus. And that's not just some flowery language that a church has to talk about this and we want to follow. No, that's a reminder every week we come here that says following Jesus is not supposed to be convenient. You see, sacrifice, it tax, it it, it pursues this convenience in our life because the Christian life is not supposed to be inconvenient. Think about the times that Jesus called people to follow him. He told the disciples, he says, follow me, and then he says, I will make you. What Jesus is saying is, I'm going to, if you'll follow me, I'm going to form you into my image. And by the way, Jesus is the ultimate picture of sacrifice. You and I are sitting here. We have a a reserved home in heaven one day because Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross. The only reason we're even gathering here and not fishing or doing some hobby is because Jesus sacrificed himself for you and for me. He modeled what the Christian life is supposed to look like. And so Jesus says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Years ago, Amy and I, we got our our daughter this uh, little uh, pottery wheel. She was into crafts, and what was fascinating about this little pottery wheel was how fast it spun, because you're supposed to take the clay and put it on this wheel, and it's the speed of the wheel that actually forms the clay. And many times we think, man, life is just going too fast, or there's so much friction and tension, and it might be because, like Jeremiah the prophet says, you are on the potter's wheel, and God is forming you into his image. Now, here's what's interesting. The clay never tells the potter what I want to be. Like, we're not looking up in God saying, all right, God, I want you to make me this and do this and bless me this way. That's not the clay's responsibility or job. The potter tells the clay what it needs to be. And many times we have this mentality like, God, I'll, you know, you can form me into year, but I don't really want that part, and I don't really want that part. And it's like we're buying a car. Yeah, you know, make sure I have power locks, but I don't really need that extra. Make sure I have some nice wood panel, but no, I don't want those. And make sure I have nice hubcaps, but I don't want this. And that's not the Christian life. If we're to follow Jesus, he's saying, I will make you into my image. Following Jesus is supposed to be inconvenient. But too often we pray prayers that don't cost us anything. We pray prayers like, God, please bless me but don't require anything from me. God, keep me safe, but don't ask me to step out of my comfort zone. God, I want all of your favor, but want to give very little in return. 
We say, pray these safe prayers. We live the safe life because we like our faith until it asks something from us. Now, maybe you've been sitting here and you're like, why are we doing this to declare our future? Why is this happening? Why do we need this? And why do we have to do that? And, and I'm just telling you, maybe you were comfortable with the church when it didn't ask anything from you. And now that the church is saying, we've got to move forward, you're like getting a little uncomfortable. We hear lots of questions, and I love hearing those and remarks and responses. And one question recently that's been asked is, well, why don't we just add more services? Hey, we'll, Amy and I will preach as many times as we need to on a Sunday. We'll reach people. But here's the question I have for you. If we add a service, are you willing to serve at that service? See, sometimes the church wants the pastors to sacrifice so they don't have to. And I'm here to tell you we're all in this together. This isn't just a Pastor Jeremy show and or Pastor Isaac show or Pastor Amy thing. This is us together saying, how can we reach more people together, even if it comes at a great cost to us? Too often, many times we're like, I'm good. I'm going to heaven. My kids are saved. I have a good life. And so I'm just going to coast until heaven. And I'm going to tell you one day, if you don't get it now, you will regret that decision the moment you step before God. Because many times we think, I'm going to drive by on Sunday. I'm, I'm, you know, I like two of Pastor Isaac's three songs. It was okay. Pastor Jeremy's normally funnier. And so that was, I give him like a six. And, you know, I, the, my kids, like their craft was pretty lame. I give that like a three. And, you know, they, they, they don't offer the program that I wanted. Where's the stained glass? Like, I don't like the chairs, the color of the chairs in the worship center. So I give that a two. And all of a sudden now we are a consumer. We want to just have a church that caters to us. We want a faith that says, how can it make my life more comfortable, more convenient? You see, following Jesus is inconvenient. Following Jesus is this idea that you and I are all in this together, sacrificing and saying, hey, we will do this together because we like the growth, we like the momentum, we like the excitement, the, the energy until it attempts to cost us something. Well, yeah, you can talk about that, Pastor Jeremy. Oh, yeah, sure, I, there's probably need some space, and I get that, and I get all these things, but, you know, okay, I, well, I'll see you next Sunday. And I'm telling you, this spiritual journey, it's, it's this idea of all of us as a church saying, how can we serve our king and sacrifice for the one who sacrificed for us? You see, sacrifice attacks convenience. But the second thing I want to share with you is this. Sacrifice, it follows gratitude. Now, David, he, he goes to Arana and he says, I appreciate you wanting to give me these, these elements and give me this land and give me the, the wood for the offering. And I appreciate you trying to just make this way smooth, but I don't want the smoothest way. I want the sacrificial way. And so David says, because God's done so much in my life, because I've seen Goliath fall and I've seen bears come down and I've seen uh, the ascension to the throne and I was not even part of the bloodline. I've seen him give peace to the land and and blessing to my family. I cannot sacrifice something that doesn't cost me anything. And we have this mentality often as Christians that, that we're going to just grab and grab and grab and grab. It's like that show Hoarders. We're going to hoard God's blessing and we're going to take this. And, and you know why people hoard is because they don't think they'll ever get something again. Maybe you were blessed by God, and you're holding on to that so much because you don't know when the next blessing from God is. And I'm here to tell you, there is more where that came from. Our Father is a good God. He has gracious heart. He has large blessings for you, but we can't live with closed hands. God cannot bless closed hands. He blesses open hands. You see, closed hands, they, they take they take what they think is owed to them. They take what they think is, is rightfully theirs. They take what they deserve. But open hands say, God, these hands are just conduits for you to bless as you want. And you bless, and I'll give. And you bless, and I'll give. 
You know, there's a fascinating verse in Proverbs chapter number 11 where Solomon writes this. He says, the world of the generous gets larger and larger, but the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. You see, it's this principle of of these open hands where David was saying, God, you bless me so much that I I cannot accept this. That doesn't cost anything. But I'm I'm, I'm afraid that often Christians, what we do is we are these spiritual hoarders where we're trying to grab everything in sight so that we could bless ourselves. And God's like, well, what about others? And you're like, well, what about me? I sacrificed, I clawed, and I'm trying to get ahead. And it feels like if I give it away, I'm going to fall behind. And God's like, trust me. Believe in me. Believe that I'm going to bless you greater than you could bless yourself. Because when we have closed hands, what we're trying to do is we're trying to bless ourselves. It's like parents, when you, your kids were younger, when they get older, you can't fool them like this. But when they were younger, you took them to the dollar store and you're like, you can buy anything you want. And your kids were like, what, really? That's amazing, anything? And you're like, sure. Maybe pick two things. You're like, oh my goodness. When you bless yourself, it's like blessing yourself at the dollar store. You're holding on to some things that, frankly, in light of eternity, aren't worth very much. When you allow God to bless, it's like God takes you to your favorite store and is like, pick out anything. But too often, we want to bless ourselves. We want to say, God, this is, this is for me. God, I, I need this. I want this. I deserve this. And God's like, well, okay, bless yourself. Enjoy your time at the dollar store. I'll be over here. I had some major blessings for you, but if you got it, cool, cool. I'll bless somebody else with open hands. I love that uh, David, he bought this threshing floor. And what that was in in these agricultural terms was this space where they processed grain and they separated the wheat, which was the good part, from the chaff, which was the unused part that that didn't uh, have any place. And so what happened was in this threshing floor, the important stuff was separated from the non-important stuff. This spiritual journey has been a threshing floor spiritually for us because it's been separating the important from the non-important. There are so many things that you and I hold on to. There are so many things that we're going to die with, and we're going we're, to— this is so important to us. And God's like, are you willing to give it away? Are you willing to separate? Because I would imagine, and I'll share with you a little bit later, even in my life, there are things that I hold on to that just frankly are not very— important. And I believe God's calling us to say, hey, what is the, what's on the threshing floor in your life? What do you need to separate from and say, I've been holding on to that so much, but in light of eternity and with what God's doing in my life, it doesn't matter anymore. And so we have this, this idea of sacrifice, following gratitude, and this idea that open hands say, God, you bless me. And whatever you give, I will make sure that I am sharing and I am generous and I am sacrificing with others because that is what God has called us to do. But the last thing I want to share with you is this. Not only does sacrifice follow gratitude, but sacrifice, I love this, sacrifice affects everyone. Read this verse in, in uh, first Samuel, or 2 Samuel 24, the very last verse in 25. It says this. David built an altar to the Lord there and offered burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then the Lord was receptive to prayer for the land, and the plague on Israel ended. Because of one man's sacrifice, an entire nation was healed. Now, let me talk to you about the impact of sacrifice at the Highlands. And I want to talk to you not as the pastor, but just as a church member. I came to the Highlands in this building. I never went to the Highlands on Sierra Highway. In fact, how many of you, you, just like me, you've started coming to the Highlands in this building? Would you, would you raise your hand? Many hands all across. If you're watching online, maybe you joined us. Many hands. So you, like me, we actually enjoyed someone else's sacrifice. You see, 20 years ago, there was a group of people uh, on Sierra Highway that didn't know you. They didn't know that a a broken, divorced, single dad who didn't know anybody was coming to their church in 2012 who needed hope and restoration. 
They didn't know that your marriage was on the rocks, and they didn't know that uh, single moms and single dads, and they didn't know that the, the addicts who were struggling with addictions and chains, they didn't know you, but they sacrificed for you. Now, watch this. Watch this. How many of you were, went to the Highlands, started going to the Highlands on Sierra Highway? Would you raise your hand? Keep your hands raised. If your hand is not raised, we have a debt of gratitude. Can we thank and celebrate them? It was their sacrifice. It was their gratitude that made this a reality. See, I didn't have to give my blood, sweat, and tears to raise up this campus to reach people. I did it. I didn't have to sacrifice. I didn't have to give. I didn't have to, 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 it didn't require anything from me. But for those of you who are with me, you started coming here. Now is our time. You see, there's going to be people that don't remember having a worship service in this room. They're not going to remember having to come to 8.30 to get some space or having some elbow, not having elbow room, or they're not going to remember or know that we had to cut the sound booth in half to add seats or to uh, cr crunch our chairs up a little bit to add some more seats. They're not going to remember the times on Easter that we had no space anywhere or even on some Sundays not having any space. They're not going to remember that. They're just going to know this as we turn it over to the youth and probably young adults meeting spaces, and this is going to be the next-gen space. They're going to be in the new building, but they're going to be grateful to you for your sacrifice. You see, that's the Christian life. L let me tell you, if all you do in your Christian life is live off of other people's sacrifices, you're not committed, you're a consumer. Many times we have this thought that someone else will take care of it. Someone else will do that. Someone else will give. Someone else will sacrifice. Someone else can take uh, all the responsibility. I am just here for me. I'm calling you. Jesus is calling us to more. He's calling us to this life of sacrifice that says, this life is not my own. And when I stand before God, it, what's going to matter is all that I did to reach people and crowd heaven more. I, I love the toys. I love all the things that we have, the hobbies and all those things. But those are just temporary. And those cannot dictate the future of our life. I'm telling you, sacrifice affects everyone. Because we had a group of people on Sierra Highway who said, I don't know them. They were declaring Psalm 22, 31. They were people not even yet born, but we're going to make room for them. And church, in 2024, 20 years later, it's our moment to say we have to make room for more. Now, you might be asking, if you're on CR Highway, we're already sacrificed once, so I'm good. Well, actually, like, if you can help us again, sacrificing twice is not a bad thing for you. But sacrifice affects everyone. You see, those future people need you to be inconvenienced. But not only is sacrifice affects everyone, but sacrifice is for everyone. I've told you before, I would never, church, ask you to do something I am unwilling to do myself. And so as I've been praying over these last really few months over even this message of sacrifice, a few months ago I was asking God, okay, God, like, what do you want me to sacrifice? That's a dangerous prayer. That's a prayer in my weak moments. I'm like, I wish I didn't pray. And so God uh, revealed to me uh, one area, among some others, but one area I want to share with you where he has called me to sacrifice. If you remember last fall, I showed this picture and shared with you my shoe closet. Keep that picture up there for a moment. Now, for some, this is like a massive collection. For others, you're like, that's all you got. But this was, over the last few years, just some primarily Jordans that I had collected. And, it, and it's because when I was, you know, I grew up in the 90s, and Michael Jordan was everything. And I appreciate the LeBron and Kobe fans, but Michael Jordan is the greatest, and he dominated the 90s. And so what happened was I loved his shoes, but my family could never afford the shoes, and so I never had a pair of Jordans. And so a few years ago, I bought my first pair of Jordans, and I knew— I knew when I prayed the prayer, God, what would you have me sacrifice? I knew 
he was going to have me sell a, pair, a couple of pairs of shoes. Now, what I didn't know is as I'm praying, I'm like, okay, I'll sell two or three pairs of shoes. Uh, what I didn't know is that God would have me go to every pair of shoes and ask, should I sell this one? Should I sell this one? Should I sell this one? And now my shoe closet looks like this. Yeah, they're not your shoes. Go and clap, you know, like. I'm not trying to sound hyper-spiritual, but I was like, okay, Lord, what about this one? What about this one? And what about this one? And that's all I was left. I think I have like three pairs of Jordans left, which by the way, I mean, I'm complaining about three pairs of Jordans. Like this is ridiculous. And so God often doesn't have a sacrifice out of our necessity. He has a sacrifice out of our abundance. By the way, I, don't, don't feel bad for me. I have a pair of Jordan golf shoes that a friend got me for my birthday. So I'm doing okay. But there was one pair of shoes that I skipped over and I didn't give to the Lord. These are my favorite pair of Jordans. For the sneakerheads in here, these are the Jordan 12s. They're, this isn't even my most expensive pair of shoes, but for me, these were the pair when MJ wore these in the 90s. These were my favorite, favorite, favorite pair. And so a couple years ago, I, uh, I got these. In fact, if you remember uh, my wife's story about buying me Jordans, this was the pair she got, but they are fake because he had six fingers. But she knows how much I love this pair of Jordans. And so I, I clean out my closet. I'm like, okay, God, I think there was about probably 14, 15 pairs. I'm, I'm gonna, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell. I'm going to give those to you. And I skip this pair. And one day I was praying, and I was getting some things ready, and the Lord was like, what about these? What about your favorite pair? Oh, no, God, I mean, I, I'm, I'm good. Like, we already got a bunch of pairs. I was only going to sell three. I've got 14 on my hands. Like, that's pretty good. And God's like, are these worth more than me? Are you going to hold on to these over me? Well, and you could imagine the wrestling match I had with God. Because this isn't really a lot. But it was meaningful to me. And, and it was something that I was holding on to, and I was saying, God, I will give you everything but. God's like, that's not sacrifice. See, you might be asking yourself, well, how, how will I know if I'm sacrificing? You'll know when it makes you uncomfortable. And I remember going to the closet and looking at these shoes saying, God, like, I don't know. And for a few days, and this is no joke, for a few days, I'm like, nope, I can't, I can't, I can't. I don't even wear these very much. <laughs> but finally, it was like, Lord, okay. If what you're requiring of me is a pair of Jordans, and I am unwilling to give it, do I really know what sacrifice is? Then the Lord brought a, a, a verse to my mind. I shared this a couple of weeks ago in Revelation chapter 4. It says, they will cast their crowns before the throne in heaven. You see, you and I are going to live this life, and we're going to accumulate rewards that God's going to give us based on our faith, based on our walk, based on our actions. And what, what's going to happen in heaven is we're not going to give God our 401k. We're going to give God our crowns. And some of us, we might only have a couple of crowns to kind of lay before the Lord. Some of us might have armful of, of rewards to give to the Lord. But it's going to be the moment that made everything worth it when you stand before God and you have something to cast at His feet. And the Lord showed me in Revelation chapter 4, it does not say they will cast their Jordans at His feet. It doesn't say they're going to cast their ATVs or their boats doesn't say they're going to cast their toys. It says they're going to cast their crowns. The little boy brought five loaves and two fishes to Jesus, and he multiplied it like crazy. And so what I'm doing is I'm bringing some Jordans. And I'm going to ask God to multiply. You see, in the scope of the building, this isn't going to pay for the building. I actually saw a pastor, he gave away Jordans as an example, and I'm like, well, we got to build a building, so I can't give, a, I can't give them away. I got to sell them first, but it's this idea of what 
has attached to your heart so deeply that you cannot sacrifice because of it. You see, sacrifice is not just affecting everyone. Sacrifice is for everyone. And my prayer over the next seven days for you, and I'm going to ask you to pray this, is not, God, will you have me do something? It's, God, what will you have me do so the gospel can continue to go and will make room for more people? I don't know what it is. Maybe for shoes, you have no idea. This doesn't mean anything or connect with you, but all of us have something, and I'm willing to put my money where my mouth is, and I'm not going to ask you to do something that I am unwilling to do. And tomorrow, I'm going to ship these out because these are sold, so don't touch these, okay? I need to keep them intact. And you know what? I'm going to miss those shoes. But I love Jesus more. So here's what I'm asking you to do. The widow brought two mites, and Jesus applauded her sacrifice because it meant something to her. What means something to you that you can say, God, I'm giving it because there are people that are not yet born. There are people that I don't even know. There are people who right now are strung out somewhere in our valley that will meet Jesus one day. I'm stepping in. I'm sitting in faith of people 20 years ago. And I believe 20 years from now, people are going to be like, do you remember those people in 2024? (laughs) They sold their shoes so that we could have a space to meet and meet Jesus. I'm so grateful for the sacrifice, church. This is our moment. If this is, if you joined us in this building like me, this is our moment. It's game time. It's time for us to get in and say, hey, we're going to take the baton of sacrifice and we're going to continue our faith on to the next generation. If you were here 20 years ago and you already sacrificed for this building, again, not as a pastor, but as a church member, has a broke, single dad who didn't have any future, I'm grateful for your sacrifice. Because without your sacrifice, I don't know where I'd be. Without your sacrifice, there's a lot of people in here who don't know where they would be. And it's because of your sacrifice affecting everyone that's made all the difference. We're raising our daughters here. Jesus is alive in our family. He's alive in your family because of, not because of just like this building just just pop out of magic. It was people working, sacrificing, giving, saying, here, Jesus, you multiply. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? I want to ask you, What is God calling you to sacrifice? You know Jesus, that's awesome. If you don't know Jesus, in just a second, I'm going to give you a chance to know him, and that's the very first, that's the very first step. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the word that he gave, he sacrificed his son for you. But for those who do know Jesus and for those who call Highlands home, What part is God calling you to? I believe he's doing something amazing that only he can do if, as a church, we're willing to say, God, I give it all to you. For those of you who maybe your first time or you've been coming for a little while and you've never said yes to God, you never invited him into your life and you never said, God, forgive me, I know that I've done wrong, but thank you for your gift of salvation. We make this opportunity at every single service, inviting those who don't know Jesus to meet him for the first time. And so in the quietness of this moment, with every head bowed, with every eye closed, I want to encourage you, if you've never said yes, if you've never prayed a prayer, we're going to make an opportunity for you in this moment right now. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I just want to ask you, if you've never said yes, to just simply raise your hand. I won't embarrass you. I want to agree with you. Is there anybody in this room at all that would say, Pastor Jeremy, would you pray for me? Because I don't know. I've never said yes. Anybody at all in this room that would say, would you pray for me? I see you. What a great decision that you're making. It's a life-changing decision. I see you over here. I agree with you. I see you all the way to my left. I agree with you as well. I see you in the back. 
Thank you for your honesty, being vulnerable, listening to the Spirit of God. If you're watching online, you can join those that were in this room raising their hand, but pray something along these lines. Dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for me. I know that I've done wrong. I know that I'm a sinner. But would you forgive me? Would you come into my life and clean me from the inside out and help me to follow you? Thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching this message uh, from the Highlands. Our goal here at the Highlands is to become people of the Word. We love the Word of God. And the message you just heard was filled with scriptures that we pray would be an encouragement to you. Make sure that you share if you were encouraged by this message with others to help us get God's Word out. Uh, if you have not yet subscribed to our channel, I want to encourage you. We have messages and content every week that would encourage you and help you grow in your faith. And then make sure you uh, just like this video. And we want to continue to get the gospel out to as many people as we know how to, as we're able to. This is great technology. Thank you for joining us on YouTube. We pray that you're encouraged. Pray that you have a great week and that you would live out what you just heard in your daily life.